every Thursday uh, for the next, uh, uh, including today, 10 Thursdays, we'll be having these presentations. And we'd like to thank Onuma Inc., who is sponsoring this. And we'd like to offer special thanks to the National Academy of Sciences, who is uh, allowing us to launch this webinar series here from the uh, Federal uh, Facility Council at the Keck Center. If we can go to the next slide. I don't think there's still oh, no. There it is. Um, my name is Mike Bordenaro. I am the Communications Director for the Asset Leadership Network. And uh, very quickly, I'm just going to mention that uh, ISO 55000 is the asset management system, like many others that you may be familiar with. It's not a technical uh, system. It is a management system. And um, we uh, are having... Still controlling Okay, uh, so there are three main sections of the uh, uh, standard, and there are, uh, okay. Thank you as we uh, get through some of these uh, technical issues, but uh, the, the main point is that there are three parts of the uh, ISO 55000 uh, series, and ISO 55001 has seven main sections, and each section has many different uh, uh, subcategories and uh, shall statements where you're able to fill in your own uh, approach to the uh, standard. We were using these for work groups. But uh, we found that the IAM conceptual model helped us understand it better. So we organized a series of work groups around the IAM model. And our work groups created recommendations that were offered to the uh, new administration uh, before November. And we are going to be having special presentations that are kind of crazy, but uh, this is one of them. This is the cybersecurity. We're going to have something on infrastructure, the Building Smart Alliance. Thought Leadership is going to offer a series of uh, case studies um, on implementation of asset management. That's sponsored by the uh, National uh, Institute of Building Sciences. And then the city of uh, Calgary is going to provide some uh, case studies on their uh, asset management. And uh, we're going to have a few words uh, here from Rob LeBrant. Rob was, uh, is a member of the Asset Leadership Network, and uh, he's now with uh, CAMCODE. But before he was with CAMCODE, he was with the Department of Defense. He was uh, with the Office of Undersecretary of Defense. He's been involved in cybersecurity and anti-counterfeiting, and he won the U.S. EOD Exceptional uh, Civilian Service Award, and he's going to say a few words before we move on to Mike Imany, who's going to be providing the main presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So, main focus I know of Mike's brief, whom I've known for probably the last 10 to 15 years, the cross paths both in the, when he was in logistics in the U.S. Air Force, uh, fa facing issues relative to property accountability and managing assets to make sure that we had readiness for the soldiers. Um, he then moved to the Office of Secretary of Defense and worked in the real property space about the time that I left. I don't think it was a coincidence. Or maybe it was. Um, but I've, I also worked in that space. And what, what I really wanted to talk about initially is the fact that both of them require data sources, strategic data sources to be used by, in, in this case, the Department of Defense and its industrial base suppliers that contains some pretty significant data. So from a, an, an what's called personal property, which is everything that's not real property, which is a little confusing that a tank is considered a personal property item, but it is. Um, but in any case, uh, anywhere from 20 to 45 data elements would be hosted in a centralized registry, which uh, is an issue in terms of aggregation of data. So you'd be extremely careful about what data is, one, made available to users, and second, available for people who are not authorized users who might want to break into that system and try to create knowledge from the data that you've stored there. The same is true in real property. Mike and I were talking earlier, the latest is something like 50 data elements for every single piece of real property. 
uh, in the department. Again, very significant information, very significant data that um, needs not to be uh, made available. So the question really is, is you know, what's what's in common? What what is it about personal property and real property that makes it interesting for the asset management community under the asset uh, leadership network? And, and I think when you listen to the government side outside of the Department of Defense, oftentimes the focus is on facilities uh, and and property uh, in general as, as properties, if you will. Um, in the department, you see a much larger focus on the actual equipment that is in those locations. And, and again, this is simply my opinion, um, having worked that for about 10 years uh, in the department. So when you look at personal property uh, in the department, you're very concerned about, do I have the right piece of equipment with the right modifications? available at the right time for the soldier to do whatever their mission is. Um, and, and it's exactly the same as it is for a piece of real property. Do I have the facilities necessary for people to do the work of the government that need to be done? So I think there's some great parallels um, and, and I think great risks. Any time you get involved with critical infrastructure, for example, uh, there are concerns about access to power grids and, and things like that that on Mike's side, he would have had to worry about. Um, so I'm very interested in hearing what Mike has to say. On my, I had 30 years. He's trumped me with 46 years of experience in the Department of Defense. Uh, so I will defer to the Mike here. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate that. My slides are going to come up here sometime or another. There we go. Stand by while we find our slides. No, not the intro slides. Those are the slides. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody in the world and. Those of you that are on the webinar in the Washington, D.C. area, you may have made the right decision given the huge uh, rainstorm that hit a lot of us as uh, we walked from the metro station over to the Keck Center. But uh, for those that are, that are outside of the Washington, D.C. area, we're getting pummeled with uh, rain and, and actually hail out in the Fairfax County area uh, over the last hour. So we'll see what's going on. Our topic today is to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, policies and, and uh, procedures for uh, facility-related, although I'll call them industrial control systems, but facility-related control systems. Uh, my focus is somewhat DOT-oriented because that's my experience, but I hope I give it a better a better brush than just saying this is a DOD issue, uh, particularly in that I'm sure the audience includes uh, non-DOD-related folks. So. What is a industrial control system or, in fact, a uh, real property-related control system? Well, they come by different names. Uh, the first on this sheet is called supervisory control and data acquisition systems. Uh, these are typically utility systems. They typically are large uh, regional interconnection of uh, sensors and controllers across the, sometimes as much as tens of thousands of kilometers of, uh, of space uh, where they essentially uh, uh, receive that data and make supervisory control decisions. And you know, think of the great power grids. And you've seen pictures on television and the like where there's a room uh, that is just displayed with screens that have, uh, if you will, essentially the status of every uh, power system, transformer, substation, circuit breaker, and the like and uh, a, a set of uh, humans sit at a control desk and manage or oversee, supervise that control and data acquisition process. Uh, the utility industry is broken up between those control systems that sit in the large geographic space of the distribution system and those that are in the central uh, energy production facilities. So distributed control systems is the terminology used for that control system that controls the boilers and steam controls and electrical characteristics associated with the power generation. Uh, 
and ditto if this was a gas uh, a gas distribution a gas uh, uh, a gas uh, assembly point where in fact the gas uh, system will have a SCADA system that manages the pressures and controls out in the distributed pipeline but at the uh, central compressor stations they'll probably be called a distributed control system essentially they have three central parts a sensor to say what is going on a controller to say we want to change something based on that sensor condition and then some type of, uh, of uh, microprocessor based controller that says okay I'm going to make a decision to do the following thing so there's a sensor a valve and a controller well there's another subset be, uh, beyond the electric or gas uh, uh, distribution systems and those are what are called programmable logic controllers and these are essentially microprocessor based uh, switches they can be found in many of the control sectors uh, the industrial sector such as uh, manufacturing facilities will have many of these PLCs scattered throughout the manufacturing floor that are sensing and controlling conditions on the manufacturing floor and they're off they are in every one of the industrial spaces that are out there uh, in the world of real property what I would call real property related control systems we typically think of these as energy management and control uh, but they could also be part depending upon your terminology the security monitoring system the building automation system so for example they there will be a, a set of microprocessor based controllers they sense they actuate or control and they make a decision based on a microprocessor based computer code uh, elevators and escalators as well as uh, security access points and certainly the energy systems that are within the facility now the terminology you hear some in, in the literature and certainly it's becoming more and more known is something called the industrial internet or the internet of things the IOT um, for example uh, there are many homes in America today where you can control your thermostat off of your smartphone and it's Wi-Fi connected to your uh, router your router is connected to your phone so there's a sensor the thermostat there's a controller the actuator that turns the heating or cooling system on or uh, uh, turns the, uh, the electrical motor on or off and then there's ultimately the IT microprocessor based uh, controller that says what's going on and that could be in your smartphone or it could be embedded in any other parts of the system and you'll see some diagrams on this later when I speak to a control system and I speak to the cybersecurity aspects to it it has to have some type of computer or microprocessor based control and it has to have some kind of telecommunications network that ties the sensors and controllers and the uh, microprocessor based system together and those are the key pieces of what that computer or microprocessor control device or with that uh, telecommunications network comes an opportunity and a risk associated with cybersecurity. I can do more because I now have the telecommunicated system, or in fact, I could do damage to it because I have the ability to enter into the system through either the microprocessor-based controller or the telecommunications network. Sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, I happen to be working some steam projects lately, so I'm, my mindset's moved from electrical power to steam power and it's kind of fun to think about steam power uh, it's something I certainly did earlier in my career but in this particular case in the bottom left is a steam boiler it has sensors and controllers on it that senses the condition of the water level in the boiler and senses if the water level is too low to bring in new water uh, there's water that comes from the condensate return uh, which is has some temperature to it and certainly some feed chemicals to it that uh, reduce the operations of the boiler system and so the sensor senses the level of water either through the makeup system or through the condensate return system to make sure that there's enough water in the boiler so it, it doesn't launch through the top of the roof of the building and land on somebody's uh, uh, dry cleaning facility next door which happened in I think it was Texas earlier this week uh, that was a failure of a control system <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes that does happen so the three big parts of this as I see at the bottom is that controller that actuator that moves a valve the microprocessor based uh, 
uh, controller, which is the middle part, and then usually there's, uh, for any sophisticated system, there's a man in the loop, some a man or a woman in the loop, that is monitoring and controlling the operation, and that's a picture of that head end, uh, sometimes called HMI, or uh, Human Machine Interface. Yeah. Probably should make a point, uh, those particularly in the room, uh, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me, because I'm sure folks on the line are that. If you're online, uh, there is a comment box, uh, so go ahead and enter your comments in the comment box, and at some point uh, we'll pause and, and pick up the comments uh, at an appropriate time. So uh, I won't do it until I get to a particular point, but just uh, keep putting your comments in, and we'll take a couple breaks during the presentation to speak to those. Those in the room, feel free to bring up your comments as they come forward, because that will typically be our break. You all heard the term, and I'm now on the next slide, and I realize now that I didn't put page numbers on these slides, so bad for me. Um, oh, there it is in the upper left-hand corner, slide number four. IT versus OT, terminology that you're going to hear in this space. Uh, information technology, the PC that you use in your office is a piece of IT. That microprocessor-based uh, piece of controller that's sitting on the manufacturing floor is typically called operational technology, or sometimes called cyber physical systems, or sometimes are called the Internet of Things, or sometimes are called, uh, even in the Department of Defense terminology, the platform IT. But what's the difference between these information technology and operational technology systems? Well, the information technology IT is typically refined defined in the corporate suite, and operational techn uh, technology is typically on the production floor. That's a good way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is uh, uh, the information technology is typically uh, PC or Mac-based, and the operational technology is typically microprocessor-based, although that's hard to define because if you open up your PC or your Mac, you're going to find microprocessors sitting inside of them. Uh, information technology typically does business information transactions, where operational technology does primarily process information transactions. Um, typically on the IT system, unless it happens to you, if a failure of a PC, uh, how many times have you created a Word document and uh, deleted it before you saved it? And that's probably not a good thing. It impacted you, but probably not too many other people. Whereas in the data processing world, uh, excuse me, in the operational technology world, data processing failures, that transactional information associated with some temperatures and pressures and voltages and other physical attributes, the loss of that data could cause a boiler to uh, starve from water, and in that case, uh, blow up or a pilot light uh, extinguishes, but in fact the gas flow continues, the buildup of natural gas in a building that could potentially cause problems. Now, a well-defined industrial control system will have hardware fail-safes. So, for example, a loss of a pilot light will, uh, will in fact shut off the gas flow independent of the automated control system. Typically at a higher threshold, the higher threshold would sense it at a lower threshold accumulation of gas, whereas the, the hardwired control uh, mechanisms in the boilers or heating tanks or whatever uh, tend to be at a higher level of uh, allow the failure to occur a little bit longer, hoping that it will recover. Information technology is typically refreshed uh, through the IT community on somewhat of a regular basis whereas the operational technology may not be refreshed until the building system is refreshed. Sometimes there's a reason for that in certain industrial processes. Once you start the process, and I'm thinking some chemical processes where uh, large uh, vats of acid are involved, for example, you can't uh, stop or, or change that process unless you literally empty the tank from whatever is that caustic or, or chemical that is being processed in the, in the control system. And so hardware and software refresh is problematic and, in fact, typically not done until the equipment is worn out and replaced. Uh, five years maybe on the IT side, 
25 or 30 years on the side of the uh, operational technology. Today, certainly, cybersecurity is baked into the IT systems, but on the cybersecurity side associated with control systems, until very, very recently, it was an afterthought. Um, I cannot, uh, I can't count the number of times I've gone into energy control systems uh, in the building space and seen the entire layout of passwords tacked to a bulletin board above the uh, operator's panel. And that's okay if you maybe have a lock on the door and you know who's in that room, but really that's the basic uh, uh, protection number one in cybersecurity is uh, know your uh, passwords, but don't broadcast them. And in fact, in the IT world, uh, password control is typically what's called two-factor authentication. It is something that I physically have, a card, a TIP, a uh, CAC, and something I know, something in my head. And so if I lose my card, they can't uh, get to the system. If they co-op me, hopefully the card is with me so that they can't co-op me and get my password and the, and the card at the same time. So it's a physical system. And of course, in some secure uh, cyber environments, biometrics are used, which are basically baked into the human being, a fingerprint, an eye retina scan, or whatever. I have a comment. Sure. Are you familiar with Mac.gov? Sure. It's the two-part uh, authentication yes. for uh, people, but the DOD and VA is using it for facilities. So. Right. Max.gov is a platform for collecting data, and it has two-factor authentication on it. Regardless if you're worried about uh, uh, activities inside of the Veterans Affairs that collect data in the, in the uh, Max.gov environment, or DOD that uh, uses it primarily for data transfer of files. So yes, uh, Max.gov is certified for two-factor authentication and it's being used in the real property space to a degree. Yep. Uh, probably the biggest difference between uh, information technology and operational technology is the priority of importance of the activities being done. In the case of uh, IT, the confidentiality of the data is probably the most important aspect of the security of the IT system, followed by integrity of the data and then the availability, that is to say that the computer system is available to pull the data out. On the process control system, we're turning that kitty wampus the other way. Think of a nuclear power plant and you walk into the control center and all the buzzers and business, business all the buzzers and whistles are, are uh, alarming and enunciating and uh, the uh, computer screen says, please put in your two-factor authentication now. Sorry, you need to do it again sorry, you are locked out, call your supervisor. Meanwhile, all the buzzes and, and whistles are still blaring away. In the fact, in the case of control systems, uh, without question, the availability of the system real time is critical to those processes. If they're critical to those processes, availability becomes the priority and confidentiality becomes last. Say, for example, in many of the energy management systems I'm familiar with, the early versions didn't have the ability to do two-factor authentication password control. And so, in fact, what we did was put a physical layer of control. That physical layer was we had a locked door and a controlled access to the control room. And so, therefore, we knew who was in the control room, and straight folks couldn't be in the control room. And that's how we ensured confidentiality was through not two-factor authentication because it was too costly to incorporate that into the data system, IT systems, the operational technology systems we had. It was easier and better and quicker for us to find another control mechanism, and the control mechanism we had was essentially locked doors. Likewise, in the uh, control system, uh, it is not an un, it is very typical to find that the panel boards, the containers that hold the microprocessor-based control system, are alarmed. Uh, with an alarm system so that if, in fact, somebody opens up the, uh, uh, the panel, uh, then, in fact, the operator gets a signal that says panel number 73 at building number such and such has been opened. 
may not know who opened it, but we know it's been opened. Uh, we can use the radio to find out that you know the workman was there. The procedures, at least in well cyber secure industrial control systems, is that there's a protocol that the uh, the mechanic calls the control center first and says, I'm at panel six, I'm about to open the panel door. Panel door gets open, uh, the control uh, system operator says, uh, copy, door is now open. And then it's buttoned up at the end and the control operator is watching the uh, buttoning up and the alarm system reset. And the last uh, communications, radio communications, is from the, from the mechanic who says, I've now controlled and secured the door. And he can't leave until the system operator says, I see that, you're free to go. Now you have, an, you have the availability, integrity, and confidentiality that you'd want to have with the control system. Every system depending upon what's being controlled. So what's next? Well, we should probably talk about something called vulnerability risks and consequences. Let's talk about my air conditioning system in my house that I have a smartphone that I can control right here in this room today. Well, probably not air conditioning, maybe heating, or by tomorrow at this time, heating. Well, there's a vulnerability in that system uh, in a couple ways. Uh, if my phone is left uh, unlocked, somebody could turn my air conditioner on or turn my air conditioner off or my heating on or my heating off. They could run my bill up. They probably wouldn't get the hot house cold enough or hot enough to do damage to the physical house. I have overrides, so the system will only get so hot or so cold. So there's a vulnerability, yes. Somebody could take my phone and reset the reset points on my air conditioner, run my electric utility bill up. But I don't think the risk is significant enough that it would cause life saving or life, uh, uh, life consequences. And so always need to look at this from a vulnerability risk and consequences point of view. What is the vulnerability? Many things are vulnerable. What is the risk? Eh, at this point in re my retired life, my cell phone probably gets left on my desk at home and doesn't even come with me when I leave the house. Okay, so mm, low risk. Consequences? Yeah, the house electric bill could go up. But now you could take a critical DOD facility or what uh, Rob mentioned, a critical a critical infrastructure facility and the vulnerability risk and consequences need to be weighed. Your security needs to be laid into account based on the level of vulnerability risk and consequences. Now I'm not going to read through every step of this uh, slide. I, I'm going to hitch up about three of them. I'm going to point to the bottom of the slide and said I, I, I uh, stole famously from wonderful resources in this particular case, the National Institute of Science and Technology, their special publication 800-82 Rev2, and provided a URL link to that uh, to that document. So my recommendation to you is, if you have further interest in this area, take a look and see if I bookmarked the slide. And if I did, that's a, probably the best resource I personally know. And I'm going to hit about two or three of these things and talk about vulnerability risks and uh, consequences. I already talked about my air conditioner, but let's jump down to uh, the third one, inaccurate information sent to system operators. Let's say uh, I have this wireless system that's tied from my cell phone through my router to my air conditioner. If somebody started jumping on that Wi-Fi system, could they be passing bad information or inaccurate information? I don't even see it. In fact, my cell phone says everything is A-OK. -okay. Meanwhile, the air conditioner is beating its way, trying to get to minus 42 in the house. So inaccurate information can be sent to the system operators, be those human operators or sensors and controllers, <coughs> electronic operators, either to disguise and authorize changes or to control or cause operations to initiate in an appropriate action. As I said, in most cases, at least in my world of real property and control systems, there's always a set of other safety controls outside of the automated system. In fact, interesting, and Stacy, you may see this in the Corps of Engineers, I've certainly seen it in the Air Force, where the energy management control system operators are thinking they're operating their system, and the system operators have gone, or the system mechanics, so electricians and mechanical guys, have gone down in the mechanical rooms and switched the controllers 
from automatic mode, meaning that the energy management control system is in control, and put it into what's called HAND, H-A-N-D, HAND mode, which means that it's being run manually and locally. Well, I could sit there at the control center all day long trying to send signals to it, and it won't respond because it's not been put back into the automatic control. Um, where I was going with that is you got to be careful of everybody in the stream doing the job they need to do. But uh, inaccurate information could be, in fact, uh, more important to us in the energy management control system world. Or it could be, and this is not necessarily on the chart, we look down, interference with operation of the equipment protected items, which could endanger costly. Okay, the second to last one, I could envision an environment where somebody jumps onto the wireless system, places what's called a foothold inside my microprocessor, and just sits there and monitors. And as he or she is monitoring remotely, because remember now they have a remote connection into the system, they begin to map the uh, energy management system and its interfaces. And every once in a while, somebody will do something like put a uh, uh, put a uh, flash drive into a non-government computer sitting somewhere in the system. And this foothold will measure that, and it will become a pattern that says the first Tuesday of every month, an outside mechanic is coming into the facility and doing certain maintenance uh, tracks. Well, once he's done that, he can begin to burrow into potentially business systems. Get out of the energy management systems into the, the corporation's business systems through that errant third party and their computer. Uh, in fact, I think it was a, an Army uh, general officer to me once said, I'm more concerned about the guy that comes in with the laptop from outside, outside the fence and uses his laptop as a diagnostic uh, tool and measures how well the air conditioner, elevator, or escalator is running and leaves behind malicious code in the system, which is okay to the system. Worst it can do is cause the elevator not to work or the escalator to go backwards. But then could become a foothold for penetrating in its time the business systems if, in fact, there's, uh, there's failures of processes and controls where, in fact, the business system jumps over to the control system. Isn't that how one of the credit card companies lost millions of uh, accounts? Well, there is a claim that, and the question was, what happened at Target uh, it, with their IT cyber to that, listening to some of the scenarios you ran through. Um, at the Building Smart Alliance and National Institute of Building Sciences, we're interested in standards and relating to the building industry. And a lot of the discussions relating to buildings and assets are, or buildings are seen as static pieces of information. You use them to design and construct. But a lot of the scenarios you're describing are information about location and relationships and even people moving through the building. So the dynamic nature of things happening relating to security in a physical facility with assets is of interest to us and has been. 
Um, and the other part is kind of the, 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 the connection between there's a lot of complexity and more devices, more connections, more security needs. And there's also the need for access. And if you combine those two, how do you solve it? So I guess the, the it's kind of a just brainstorming here, but it seems like for to us for, for a while that there are opportunities if we really look at how buildings and facilities and assets are tracked in their physical format, whether in a digital model or in the physical world, along with kind of layer the layering of the need to, for access and security seems like a huge opportunity. Have you seen good examples of that or are, are there things that we can do and identify as uh, something that we can uh, collaborate on or work together to solve? This is a complex problem that obviously every owner has and I think it's an opportunity. Well, sure. And in fact, a lot of owners have uh, controlled access facilities where they use some type of a uh, electronic uh, a key card system for entry and obviously that entry system will give you the number of people that happen to be in that building at that moment in time. Very important information say for example during an emergency uh, situation where you need to egress people out of a building, uh, do you have everybody accounted for? Uh, this is the beginnings of a way to do accountability for emergency uh, preparedness and planning. Uh, at the same time the building owner has a need to understand how well is the building being utilized. If the building houses uh, 800 people and on an average monthly basis only 400 people are in the building, it's probably underutilized. And maybe you could uh, find out where those spaces are that are better utilized. Let me give you an example. Uh, many of the major uh, department store uh, uh, companies today will track you through your cell phone as you walk through your their retail store. And they will measure how much time you're spending in front of the cosmetics section versus how much time you're spending looking at ties versus how much time you look at shoes. And they'll make decisions based on uh, traffic that uh, accumulates. They don't know the individual that's masked on the individuals, but they know, you know that the, the shoe department gets more traffic than the tie department. So therefore, you probably want to have more shoes out in display space than ties. And maybe I'm wrong on ties versus shoes, but I'll use, I didn't want to touch the cosmetics at all. But uh, the point gets to here is that uh, uh, there is a, there are practical applications where the Internet of Things are coming together in ways that uh, uh, can protect the per personal identity, at least the belief that personal identity is, is solved. Uh, there's a Finnish company that put in a uh, RFID tag, Rob, and everybody's uh, between their thumb and their first finger and uh, tracking people through an RFID tag. Now that might be okay in Finland, but I don't think that's going to work in the United States, at least not right now. So, come on, I think there's some opportunities. There are beginning of applications. Certainly the whole BIM or building information model uh, process is what we're talking about here. And in fact, I will challenge people to say that the building isn't as static as people think it is. There's walls being torn out and new walls put in and uh, <clears throat> new reuses of space, et cetera, et cetera. And the Pentagon's a classic example of that where uh, if you don't have a system of accountability, you frankly lose control of who's, who are the tenants and where are they. When there's a, a monetary incentive, i.e., uh, you get rent from these folks, and the folks who are renting pay a very good attention to how much rentable square foot they have, and the people that are selling the rentable square feet are also paying attention of uh, uh, is there an opportunity to move these people to another space so that I can accumulate uh, to build a larger space for a new client. Uh, everybody's into the business of knowing how many people are in rentable square foot. That answer the question? Yes, thank you very much. That's a great point. Uh, the important one is that buildings are not static. They are, they are very dynamic. Um, if we can just accept that as a fact, as, as it goes in from the design, construction, and operation, it's still con constantly moving. And the security layer on top of that is also constantly moving. So I think that's, that, yep. that is the opportunity there to solve that. <clears throat> so the next slide, uh, slide number six, speaks to cybersecurity objectives. And from my point of view, protecting individual components from exploitation is probably one of the most critical cybersecurity uh, aspects. Uh, that is to say, data that is coming forward from the control system 
I don't want it exploited for other people's use, restricting out other authorized modifications to the data. Uh, all those kinds of things are the objectives of any kind of a good cybersecurity program. Uh, how do you implement it? Well, you use a set of series of controls and overlays. Now this chart, chart number seven, is a partial list of about 800 uh, controls and overlays that are available uh, through the, uh, the, through the uh, National Institute of Technology and Standards Special Publication 800-52. But I actually pulled this from a separate document, a SANS document, as you see down at the bottom, where DOD did some uh, look at its facility-related control systems and started asking, what are the key controls that are probably the best for the real property aspects. And the personal property folks have done something similar to that. And Rob, you might want to take just two seconds and say, where's personal property in all this business of cybersecurity? So I think it personal property really gets uh, interesting in terms of cybersecurity in a facility when it's connected to the facility. So one of the things I was going to ask you about I remember in 2004 when I first went to NATO headquarters, you couldn't plug your <laughs> laptop or your phone into the wall because they were afraid you were going to get into the system through the through the electrical system. And at the time, that seemed sort of preposterous. But as we move along, I'm not sure that's the case anymore. And so I think you know, vulnerabilities for personal property sitting in a facility may, in fact, be the fact that it's connected to the infrastructure of the facility. Uh, Sure, and a good example of that is, is uh, the advanced weapons systems typically have some type of a, uh, a uh, structured maintenance aid that can communicate with the weapon system, but then has to communicate with the back shop in order to have all the, all the right maintenance procedures, uh, supplies and equipment laid out and ready to do whatever is the performed uh, uh, scheduled maintenance that's required. And so that tie between the front and the back, the weapon system and the infrastructure all the way back through is critical. I'm less concerned about the electrical, uh, connecting to the electrical system. Inherently, 60 hertz is very noisy. And that's why you don't see a lot of, uh, of internet over the power lines. It's, right. it's been attempted a couple times. It's coming back again. Uh, but uh, part of the problem is once you get to a transformer, Inherently, a transformer is not a good transformer of other than 60 hertz. So when you put a larger frequency into a transformer, it usually doesn't come out very well. It'll come out very uh, degraded. So the point of this chart here is to say that there are things we can do with regards to inventorying our equipment so we know what's there, uh, particularly in, in uh, inter the uh, inventory of what ports and input-out devices have uh, access, and particularly public access, and putting controls or locking those public accesses out. Uh, central monitoring, find out, in fact, are you hacked? I mean, this is the basic trick is, uh, how do I know I'm hacked unless I find out I'm hacked? And so uh, central monitoring of uh, your system so that if you start seeing odd behavior of data flowing through the system, what you don't expect. Uh, once you, <laughs> once you uh, create the system, you need to test it and make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. The classic uh, that I bring to people's attention is uh, I kind of grew up in the Air Force's communications community as a power engineer. And so therefore, I got a lot of communication stuff pushed on me. And they taught me that when a new software uh, application or patch was brought into the facility. It went onto a development server. It was tested out for several days or weeks to make sure that it did just what the manufacturer said it was going to do. And then it was finally moved over to the operational platform. So there was a test environment and an operational environment. Uh, I can count the number of times on at least one hand where I've been around a control center where a manufacturer had sent an envelope with a with a CD-ROM on it in nice looking letterhead said please load this in your system to do patch number 77 on this and the guy gets it opens it up looks at it 
says it's from this manufacturer. That's the manufacturer of their device and loads it into the system. How hard in today's world would it be to purloin somebody's logo, create whatever type of software you want to create, and put it into a system? Now, if you do the right kind of developmental testing of that software, if there was any malicious behavior on it, in fact, indeed, that would be fixed. These are the kinds of controls that we think that the Department of Defense thinks makes sense to ensure uh, in, inbound protection and out, outbound detection. And that's the, that's, the, that's the design premise that's been laid into DOD, and I assume a lot of the federal departments and agencies. Mike, is there a, is there a parallel to the cybersecurity rules in the department uh, through the DFARS that require reporting of cybersecurity incidents? Um, I can only assume, yes, that all contractors, regardless if they are weapons, systems contractors or building systems contractors are required to uh, identify their uh, cyber securities to have a cyber security plan and that was due by last month or whatever so my assumption is the main main manufacturers are doing that it's a good question uh, I don't have the direct answer but I would presume the answer is yes I can tell you that there are some DFAR uh, clauses that we've added excuse me the Department of Defense have added to help in our new acquisitions of, of facilities related control system to ensure that we get to the cybersecurity stuff we want. And we appreciate those being in the DFARS because it's a lot easier to then incorporate them in the contracts. Because back when I back when I was working in the DFARS on cybersecurity, it was solely focused on the tax on your IT system. Yeah. It was not on you know, the so. Well, and in fact, uh, you know, I had a number of people ask me, what keeps you awake at night in this business? And I said, gee, it's when we get attacked, what are we going to do? And I think I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to send a memo out that says, uh, turn all those puppies on to manual. Remember I said it's manual, off, and automatic? Turn them on manual until we figure this out. So we had this scapegoat that all of our systems had this less than optimized energy management control that was done with the higher order safety controls. But that's not the best way to run the railroad. Uh, and in fact, uh, what has happened in the last five years is the Department of Homeland Security has created a parallel organization, so-called ICS CERT, to the IT's world. So when the IT manufacturers get hacked, they have a process of going into DHS and saying, hey, I've been hacked. Uh, it's my system, operating system number three, and there is a system of getting that all the way, the patch that is developed all the way down to the system of the IT system owners. Now, we're, we're, the Department of Homeland Security is working the same thing on the industrial control side. You can go to the website. Uh, I, I, I can't say how many they have. I don't know. Uh, it's not that I can't say. There's a published site where they say, here's the number of, of hacks that have occurred. Here are the patches that have been put in place, and there's a monthly track of those. And it happens on a monthly basis that there's a new patch released. Sometimes this happens from a white hat that's looking and exploiting and finding and going to the manufacturer and hopefully uh, convincing the manufacturer to pay them for a service, and they do. Uh, DHS does their own, and uh, the manufacturers do their own also, their own checking for vulnerabilities, risks, and consequences. So uh, if you're in this business or you're overseeing this business, somebody should be looking at the ICS, ICS certs. You really want, what you really want to do is you want to tag this in such a way that if you have, and I'll just pick a name because it's out there, Honeywell, Johnson Controls, uh, Siemens, if you have that system, flag it this, uh, this uh, website so that every time there's an alert, you at least get notified of the alert, or have somebody who's watching this on a daily basis and have the protocol that says, okay, there are seven of these systems because you've inventoried them. That's in the Department of Defense or Department of Veterans Affairs. They're at places one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's get them patched. And the way the IT side of this works is they send the notice down in the form of what's called a notum or a notice of uh, two airmen, if you will, notice that there's this 
patch available. And it remains open until the field comes back up to the central point and says, I got it, I received it, I loaded it, I tested it, and I'm now loaded patch number seven into the system. And so there's that procedure and that uh, discipline to make sure that patch management is occurring. That doesn't exist across the field of control systems. I bring out this chart and just because, frankly, when I stole it from the uh, Department of Energy, it was one page. And when I tried to put it on one page, it was so small you couldn't read anything on it. But I bring out the point that in the electric utility sector, cybersecurity efforts over the last 10 years, and before I retired from the Air Force in 2009, uh, for the, about the eight months before that, I was on a, a special task force between the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy looking at the electric utility sector. And what we were asking, what we were asked to do is, what are the research and development things that need to be done in order to be able to secure the electric utility grid. That was 10 years ago. And there was a, a set of uh, research needs that were identified and have been funded by the Department of Energy and have been implemented by the utilities uh, underneath the guise of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. And while they're certainly still on their journey, that research development has paid them off well. And my footstomp to the facilities world is that a lot of that technology could be made into a less than utility grade box that can withstand 500,000 volts and 33,000 amps. And in fact, be put into the industrial and commercial system. And I'm talking about small sensors that can be, if you will, so-called bumps in the wire. So these are passive devices that sit in the transmission line, the data line. And if the data comes out different than what's expected, this bump in the wire can alarm and say, this isn't good data. And you, you don't want to buy the utility version of that because it comes in a box about as big as the table that I'm sitting at. But in fact, when you look at the electronics that's in it, it could be micro-sized for the voltages that currently work in the building system. So I only footstomp that to say that uh, DOD has picked up on this. And I, uh, if for those in the other federal agencies, uh, there is an organization called the Environmental Security Technology Demonstration and Compliance Program, or ESTCP, footnoted down below. And they've done a phenomenal job over the last three, four years of putting R&D dollars into this space of facility-related industrial control system, cybersecurity. And I would encourage all the departments and agencies to purloin every bit of that DOD money that was spent on these kinds. And this is just a small subset of work done in uh, making in information assurance guidance. You know, part of the problem that DOD has, and I'm sure the other federal agencies have, is getting the uh, authority to operate approved through the decision maker in a timely fashion. Some of that's been attempted to be done here. Uh, I will submit to you that last one, the Advanced Cyber Industrial Control System Tactics, Techniques, and Procedures document. That actually did not come out of the ESTCP effort, so I probably need to fix that slide. That actually came out of some joint work between uh, the Department of Defense and the uh, U.S. Uh, Office of Secretary of Defense and U.S. Cyber Command. But it's still a very good piece of a body of work. And that's my slides. I hope there's some more questions, but you're not alone in this business. If you're on the real property side, this has been looked at by the electric side, the banking side, the health side. I mean, you know, think about your day and consequences and risks and vulnerabilities with a really cool pacemaker, pacemaker that can be wirelessly monitored and controlled. Whoa. In fact, uh, Vice President Cheney had one of those, and it was dis all the wireless controls were disconnected on it when they put it in for obvious national security reasons. And I don't know what they did when he left the White House, but I know that for a fact that it was disconnected. So there are a whole bunch of other communities out there thinking these same kind of things. Uh, healthcare uh, and the electric sector, in my opinion, is a little bit farther ahead 
than the building area. Uh, on the other hand, this will not sound very good to you, the, uh, the oil and gas industry is probably further behind of the building world. At least it was when I looked at it last. And some of it is their internal controls, their safety controls are rigorous to begin with. And so even if there was automated systems that attempted to overpressurize a line, uh, the safety systems would, uh, would shut down whatever it is that was trying to overpressure the line. So they, they, they looked at the risk consequences and vulnerabilities and said, I think our safety systems are good enough for right now. But they're not really. They need to be done. Uh, the Corps of Engineers dams world is definitely in, in the business. It's not shown on this chart. But I can speak to the civil work side of Corps of Engineers. And the dam security or cyber security is frankly getting a lot of attention, a lot of good attention and rightly so. So that's my pitch. Maybe there's some more questions yes. on this um, line. As I mentioned, the Building Smart Alliance thought uh, leadership is uh, going to be doing one of the, the mm -hmm. webinars. And Mike Chipley is a member of Yes, the, You're familiar with Mike? Mike is. Mike, I better tell Mike that I've used some of his slides, or you'll see him again. <laughs> well, he's on the hey, line. Mike, 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 Mike. I'm on. Look, great presentation. Did I pass? No, you did great. <laughs> Good morning. Good afternoon to you. What can hey. I do? Um, hey, Mike, I got three updates to follow on uh, the great stuff you just talked about. Um, we are going to have a joint Society of American Military Engineers and Washington Metropolitan Council of Governments uh, Cybersecurity and Facility Related Control Systems Workshop an hour and a half on June 13th at the MCOG Training Facility. That is open to anybody, private sector, um, government. Uh, the next is uh, Cybercom just released the uh, ACI TTPs version 1.0 February 2017. I've already updated this uh, whole building design guide cybersecurity resource page. Uh, so that document is now available. Uh, it will go onto the ESTCP website as soon as Tim can get that over to the webmaster. And then um, uh, the uh, uh, DHA, Defense Health Agency, uh, we held a cyber charrette back in January, and we have cataloged now 30 medical facility systems uh, for hospitals, clinics, vets, dental, et cetera. Um, and we have now created the first categorization memo and policy. So for medical facilities, we are moving very quickly. Uh, all that information should come out in the public domain hopefully within the next uh, month. Well, um, good update. Thank you. Uh, make sure to uh, make that available, and uh, we'll connect that to the material we uh, make public about Mike's presentation. Any other questions? Um, Not uh, online, right? Yeah. How about around the table? Right. Yeah, so one of the challenges on the procurement side relative to the cybersecurity reporting, which I mentioned earlier, it's purely cultural. And you get the industrial supplier who doesn't really want to acknowledge that he's been hacked and is afraid that if he's been hacked and it's acknowledged that he may somehow be penalized in future acquisitions. How is that playing in the, in the facility side? We're too naive as a community to understand that problem. And so I don't think people know it enough yet. Uh, break that down. Um, I think your major controls manufacturers, uh, they, they got it. In fact, frankly, uh, one of those came to me with the comment that says, we're actually concerned because you guys are, you guys in defense are doing a good enough job because you never bought our maintenance package. So if you buy your maintenance package, we'll fix all your vulnerabilities, which was a pretty thin veneer to uh, extortion, but okay, hold that thought. The point was, they were concerned that, if you will, we get hacked, and then we drag them down. I think the culture is changing on, on the procurement side for the industrial base, too, because I think, frankly, the, it's such a common occurrence now. If you have no incursions or cybersecurity reports, that's a, almost as suspect as if you have several, because at least you're looking. Yeah. Yes, I, Rob, I totally agree with you. Well, that's.
That's my pitch, Mike. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. We are spot on the top of the hour. So thank you, Mike Imany. Uh, thank you to uh, Cameron Ostig and the National Academy's Federal Facility Council. And thank you to Onuma Inc. for sponsoring this. Uh, please sign up for uh, the other webinars that are, are coming up, and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Finally, if you are in D.C. and the rain has stopped, please join us at Oya Mel Restaurant, 401 7th Northwest. Uh, we're going to continue this discussion uh, in a casual uh, dinner. Thank you, everyone.